Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about thermal energy. In particular, changes in thermal energy. Okay? Now, we talked a little bit about how it is you can transfer thermal energy, that's heat. Okay, so you can take a hot object and a cold object, put them into direct contact, and thermal energy will flow from the hot to the cold object. Transfer of thermal energy, or you can separate them. That can transfer, that can happen by radiation, there's convection, all that kind of stuff. But you can also <clears throat> just generate thermal energy, okay, okay, just with friction. So I can go like this, I can press my hands together, and I can rub like this, and oh, look, I feel my hands warming up. The thermal energy in the atoms in my hand is increasing. So the random um, kinetic, uh, the, the random jiggling, uh, the, uh, the kinetic energy associated with the random jiggling is increasing. And so what's happening there, of course, is that, that chemical energy in my body is being um, um, transferred into thermal energy in the atoms in my hand. And how is that happening? Well, the transfer mechanism here is work. There's a force acting through a displacement. It's force of friction, there's a displacement, okay? And so, it's super important, um, even though there's friction, energy is conserved. Energy is a strictly conserved quantity. What's happening here is that, you know, chemical energy is being converted into thermal energy. When I take a, a block on a table, I, I give it an initial push that initially has some kinetic energy, it slows down and comes to rest. Kinetic energy disappears. Well, where did it go? It went into the thermal energy. Uh, of, um, so the atoms at the bottom of the block and, uh, and along the table, the track of the table, have heated up. Okay, the increased thermal energy. So energy is always conserved. It's a conserved quantity, whether there's friction or not. Okay, so delta E thermal, so we're going to talk about changes in thermal energy, in particular uh, due to friction. And this could be friction of various types. So it could be, uh, you know, kinetic friction like we just talked about, or it could be wind resistance of an airplane flying through the air, or say, uh, you know, water resistance of a submarine going through a liquid, going through water and so on. So it's any form of uh, friction that opposes the motion. Okay, so we'll start with our usual generic situation where we have, um, I think this guy's running out here. Okay, so we'll start with our generic sort of three-dimensional trajectory. Uh, trajectory of an object in three-dimensional space. <coughs> and that object starts at that initial position. And say relative to some coordinate origin here, we have that initial position is described by the initial position vector, r initial. And the final position is described by the uh, final position vector, r final. Okay, so very good. And then the idea is that suppose that the object, say, is at that point at that instant of time. Now, of course, it's moving along this trajectory. And so its velocity will be in a direction tangential to the trajectory at that point. And <clears throat> the position at that instant of time is there. If we ask what's the position, say, like a split second later, well, it's over there. Okay, so the position vector changes from that vector to that vector. The change, the infinitesimal change in position, is what we call dr. Okay, so infinitesimal change in the position vector during infinitesimal time, dt, is just dr. Okay, now the crucial point is this. Um, uh, these friction forces, uh, air resistance and all, and so on and so forth, they exactly oppose the motion. So if the motion, the displacement is in that direction, the velocity is in that direction, if the motion is in that direction, the force of friction that we're going to be considering is exactly opposed. Okay, and so we'll give that force of friction, whether it's kinetic friction, air resistance, whatever, we'll give it the symbol little f, and it is a vector which exactly opposes dr. So if this is dr, then we immediately know that the force of friction is exactly opposed to that, so the angle between them is 180 degrees. Okay, so that's a crucial point. So friction opposes motion. So F opposes motion. Okay, so knowing that, we can sort of start to think a little bit about the work done by that friction force. So the work done by that friction force, that friction force F acting through um, as, as the object is displaced around its trajectory, that work done is, how do we work that out? Well, it's the force of friction 
say at this instant of time over here, vector dot product with an infinitesimal displacement dr, and so that'll be the work done or the energy transfer to the system uh, as it is displaced from there to there. And so then we, as usual, divide that path up into a whole bunch of, <coughs> excuse me, into a whole bunch of little segments like this, okay? And then we add, we sum from the initial position uh, over here to the final position over here. We add up the f dot dr along the entire trajectory. Okay, and so to simplify this a little bit, um, well, actually, <coughs> let's write it down here. So wf, the work done by friction, is going, this is a vector dot product, so it's the magnitude of the force of friction, that's f, times the magnitude of dr, and we're going to say the magnitude of dr, we're going to call that ds. So what is s? So s is uh, the length along the path. Okay, so s initial here is equal to zero. Okay, and then we mark it off. We walk along this path. This is one meter, two meter, three meter. This is s equals one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is s equal, you know, s final. Okay, and s final here is the length of that path. So there will be a parameter that just marks out, just runs along that path there. And so the length of dr is just the change in s in going from there to there. Okay, so the magnitude of dr is just ds. And then here's the crucial thing. The, um, the vector dot product includes cosine of the angle theta. And so it's um, the angle between dr and, and, and f is a 180 degrees, cos of 180 is minus 1. And so there's a minus sign here. Okay, that's, that's important. This is positive, this is positive, and we're going to integrate from s initial to s final. So this whole thing is positive, but there's a minus sign in front of it, and so this is negative. Okay, so what it says is that the work done by that, that friction force that opposes motion, what it does is it transfers negative energy to the system. So if it's a block on the table sliding like this, the work of the motion is in this direction, the force of kinetic friction is in this direction, that force opposes the motion, and it will transfer negative kinetic energy into, um, into the block. It will slow the block down and bring it to rest. Okay, very good. So, <coughs> so WF uh, negative. So just to sort of put that into words. Uh, so, for example, it removes it removes kinetic energy from a sliding block. A block sliding on a table, for instance. Okay. Now, uh, in general, of course, now we're dealing with an integral. So, if you don't know a lot, if you until you know how to do integrals, this expression here is useless. However, there is an important special case which frequently occurs, and that is where the magnitude of the force of friction is constant. And if it's constant, you can pull it out of the integral. Okay? So there's a simple case. The simplest possible case is when the magnitude of that force of friction is equal to a constant. Okay, so if that's the case, then the work done by that force of, of course the direction of the force of friction can be changing, but if its magnitude is constant, then we can pull that magnitude out, and the work done by that constant magnitude force of friction is negative. We can pull that constant magnitude of force of friction out, and all we're left with is an integral over ds, from s initial to s final. And so, what is this? You just add up all the little ds's, this plus this plus this plus this plus this, and so what you get is basically, is exactly the length of the path. So this is just negative, the magnitude, the constant magnitude of the force of friction, times delta s. Okay, delta s is s final minus s initial, is the length of the path. Okay, so that's an important um, special case. So delta s, path length. Let me just write it over here. It's important. So delta S is the path length. And the path length is not, in general, the same as the magnitude of the displacement. Remember, the displacement 
from initial position to final position is a vector which points from initial to final. That's that vector. The length of that vector is the length of that line. And the length of that line, in general, is not the same as the length of the path. Okay? <clears throat> so pay attention to that. So now let's do an example here, kind of an interesting example, a really instructive kind of example. So don't quite have room to draw the picture here, so let's draw it up here. Um, so what we've got is a tabletop, horizontal tabletop. Okay, like that. Uh, I'm going to move it over a little bit. Okay, so we're going to need some room. In fact, why don't I just do it this way? I'll just say, I'll draw a circuit or trajectory here. And this is a circuit or trajectory happening on the top of a tabletop. Horizontal tabletop. And the idea is that we've got um, a block. Okay, and that block is sitting on the tabletop. And there is a coefficient of kinetic friction. Where can I put this? Let's put it over here. There's a coefficient of kinetic friction. The block has some mass m, and there's a coefficient of kinetic friction between the bottom of the block and the top of the table. And so when that block moves, there's going to be a force of kinetic friction opposing its motion. Okay, so we got that. And <clears throat> what we're going to imagine is that we've taken this block and we've tied a string to it, and we've taken that string and brought it to the center of that circle. And what we've done is we've given and the radius of the circle is, is R. Sorry, there's lots of things going to be in this picture. I want to put this so that we don't sort of run out of room here. So the radius of the circle is R. <clears throat> and then the idea is we give this block a push uh, tangential to the circle. So it has some initial velocity um, in that direction. So this is the initial. And obviously there's going to be some friction acting, and so that block will have some initial velocity around that circle. And then as it slides around, it will slow down, slow down, slow down, and eventually come to rest somewhere. Let's suppose that it comes to rest right over here. Okay, and so the angle that it travels through is, let's call that angle theta. Okay, so very good. And we're going to say that V final here is equal to zero starts at some initial velocity, friction acts, and it comes to rest. V final is equal to zero. And the whole thing is taking place in a gravitational field, G acting down like that. And what else do we need on this picture? Okay, so um, we're going to um, uh, solve this problem. We're going to try to figure out what is this angle theta. Okay. Given that initial velocity, and given mu k, and so on and so forth, and the mass, uh, through what angle will that block uh, move around that circle before it comes to rest? So that's going to be the unknown that we are going to be solving for. And we're going to try to solve for that unknown using the work kinetic energy theorem. Okay, So the work kinetic energy theorem says that the total work done, which means the work done by all of the forces acting on that block as it's moving along its trajectory, that total work done must equal the change in the kinetic energy of that block. But the important thing is we need to identify all of the forces acting on that block. And so we need to basically draw a free body diagram. So let's see, we'll start with the field forces, that's gravity. So gravity is pulling down, so there's a force of gravity just mg pulling down, and the tabletop is exerting a normal force, at least, uh, up like that, so there's a normal force n, okay, and what else? Oh, as this thing whips around, that string is going to be under tension, and so that string is under some tension t, so there's a tension force acting towards the center of the circle, exerted by that, that taut string, and what else? Oh, and of course, there is the force of kinetic friction. So the motion is that way. The friction, the kinetic friction that the table exerts on the block will be exactly opposed to the velocity. So it'll be coming back like this, tangential to the circle, but directly opposing the motion. So it looks like that. So we have uh, one, two, three, we have four forces acting on that block. And so let's work out W total. So work total 
Let's see, can I put this down here? I think I can put it down here. So work total is equal to the work done by all four forces as that object moves on its trajectory from here to here. Okay, so there will be the work done by the gravitational force as it goes over its trajectory, plus the work done by the normal force as it goes over its trajectory, plus the work done uh, by the tension force, T, as it goes around its trajectory, plus the work done by the force of kinetic friction as it goes around its trajectory. Okay? Now, one thing that's really important here is to think carefully about these work terms. It looks like you have a lot of work to do, but in fact, there's virtually no work to do. Um, because the work done by the gravitational force, for instance, is equal to, is just strictly equal to zero. And that's because at any instant of time along the trajectory, suppose we're going like this, uh, the gravitational force is straight down, and the dr, so this is force of gravity, is straight down, perpendicular to the tabletop, and dr is <coughs> the displacement from here to here, is in a direction that's horizontal, like on, you know, uh, tangential to the tabletop. And so dr and the force of gravity are perpendicular, okay? And so, um, so gravity does no work as that, um, as that block slides around. In other words, the gravitational force is not uh, transferring any energy to that block. Okay? And similarly, the work done by the normal force. The normal force is uh, uh, perpendicular to the table up. And so dr is always perpendicular to the normal force. And so the normal force doesn't do any work either. So the normal force does not um, transfer any energy to that block. Okay? Forces that are perpendicular to the displacement don't change the speed, remember? So they don't change the kinetic energy, they don't transfer energy to that block. Um, and the work done by the tension force, did I just say that? The work, done by the, normal, the work done by the tension force is also zero because at any instant of time, the tension force is directed towards the center of the circle, but dr is tangential to the circle. And so they're always perpendicular. So the work done by the tension force is also equal to zero. Okay, so <clears throat> this often happens that you, would, you, would, you, you would draw a free body diagram with a lot of forces, but most of them don't do any work. And so the only force doing work or transferring energy to that system, changing the kinetic energy of that block, is the force of kinetic friction. Okay, so that's an important thing to say. Um, and then we say, ah, so what is the force of kinetic friction, first of all? So what is the magnitude of the force of kinetic friction? The direction of the force of kinetic friction is always changing, okay, as that block moves around. But its magnitude, uh, the magnitude is simply mu k times the magnitude of the normal force. And the magnitude of the normal force is obviously just equal to the weight, mg. So that's mu k times mg. And so the magnitude of this opposing force of friction, kinetic friction in this case, is constant. Okay, so that's nice because when we're dealing with forces, frictional forces of constant magnitude, we can just pull that force out, and the work done by that by that frictional force is just negative the constant magnitude of the force times the path length. Okay, so this work done by kinetic friction we can just read it off of here, is just negative. The work done is negative. It's the magnitude of the force of kinetic friction. How do I want to write this? Minus Fk, okay, times uh, delta S, times the length of the path. Now remember, the object was displaced from here to here. The displacement vector is this guy. This is delta R. We're not interested in the magnitude of the displacement. We're interested in the actual path length. You know, how many meters this thing moved around. And so, let's, um, let's just take the next step here. So it's negative. The magnitude of the force of kinetic friction we worked out is mu k times m times g. And then the, the, the displacement, the length of the path from there to there, is the length of this, um, you know, portion of uh, of a circle and so remember that if you if you've got a circle like this and you move say from here over to here and so the angle that you've gone through is theta and the radius of the circle is r then the path length from here all the way around to there that delta s is just r times theta because when theta becomes a full 2 pi 
well then the the path length becomes the, the circumference of a circle and just becomes 2 pi r that's the formula for the circumference of a circle so this is a super important thing to know just generally just get it in your head important to know so in this case the path length is just the radius of of the circle times the angle theta so just r times theta okay so very good and then the last thing we need to work out is the uh, I'm going to run out of room here, so let's just do it up here. The change in the kinetic energy, well, the change in the kinetic energy is final kinetic, uh, which is zero, minus initial kinetic. So change in the kinetic energy is negative, one-half m times v, the initial speed squared. Okay, so we have that. And so according to the work kinetic energy theorem, what we have is the total work done. That turns out to just be the work done by the frictional force. And because the magnitude of the frictional force was constant, we had a really easy way to calculate that. And so we got the work done by that frictional force is this guy over here. Okay, so this is the total work done is this guy. And we make that equal to the change in the kinetic energy. And the change in the kinetic energy is this guy. So that equals that. Okay, and then we just solve for theta, what it is we wanted to work out. And so I'm going to put that answer down here. Okay, and so I'm going to put it down here, the answer for theta. If you just solve for that one equation, one unknown, <clears throat> what does it turn out to be? It turns out to be the initial speed squared divided by r. Remember that v squared over r is like centripetal acceleration. Divided by g, the gravitational freefall acceleration. Okay, and so these are, this is an acceleration divided by an acceleration that's dimensionless. Okay, divided by twice mu k, and mu k is, of course, dimensionless. So this answer is dimensionless, as it has to be, because angles are dimensionless. They're just radians, they're dimensionless, even not like meters or anything like that. And so you look at this thing and you say, well, first of all, does this make any sense? So what's interesting about this is that the angle theta, how far it's going to um, slide around that circle. And remember, theta can be larger than, uh, <clears throat> than 2 pi. It can go like five, time, five and a half times around before coming to rest. Okay, so theta could be five and a half times two pi. Okay, so what it says is that the angle theta that it slides around before coming to rest is proportional to the initial speed squared, and that's and that makes sense because speed squared is proportional to kinetic energy. And what you're doing is you're saying that that angle theta depends upon not just the speed, but actually the energy, the kinetic energy. So if you double the initial kinetic energy, it'll go twice as far around before coming to rest. Because <clears throat> basically you're just dissipating energy at a constant rate by this constant static friction, uh, kinetic friction force. Okay, and you can also see that if you make g larger, if you're on a planet with larger g, you know, then the frictional force will be bigger, and that will make theta smaller. It won't go around as far. You can also see that <clears throat> mu k, if if the friction, if the if the surface becomes uh, uh, more and more uh, like slicker. So mu k gets smaller and smaller in the denominator, then theta will get larger and larger. Okay, so as usual, it's always good to think about your answer. Does it make sense? So everything in that answer makes sense, and all is good. So now the important point, just to sort of summarize this example, is there are you know two ways to think about these 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 energy conservation. So one of them it has to do with storage, energy storage mechanisms. So if we think in terms of energy storage, the kind of thing we're saying is that, well, in an isolated system, the total energy can't change. So delta E total is equal to zero. Okay? And then we say, hmm, well, what sorts of energy are involved in, what sorts of ways can nature store energy in this situation? Okay? So one way that nature can store energy is in thermal energy. Okay, so as this block slides around, there's friction, and so the bottom of the block is going to heat up, and there's going to be an increased amount of thermal energy in that block, and the tabletop along that track over there, those atoms in that tabletop will also warm up. And you can do these experiments. You can just you can give this kind of push like this and get it go around, and you just take out a thermal camera and look at it, and you see like a hot spot along that track. Okay, so um, so the thermal energy at the bottom of the block and and the tabletop uh, uh, increases. So there can be changes in thermal energy in this uh, situation, and of course there can be changes in the kinetic energy of the block. 
And you might think, well, maybe there's changes in the gravitational field. Well, no, because the block hasn't raised up or down. It's always staying, stayed on a, on a level surface. There's been no changes in the gravitational energy and so on. So the only two forms of energy that are relevant um, here um, that nature can store energy in is thermal and kinetic. And so this is change in the sum is the sum of the changes. So change in thermal plus change in kinetic. Now in this situation, we can see obviously the change in the kinetic is negative. So that, that, that force of kinetic friction um, um, did negative work. It transferred negative work to the block. It removed, the, it lowered the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy obviously has gone down. So for that negative number plus that to be zero, it must be that there's been a change in the thermal energy, which is positive. Thermal energy has gone up. Okay. Now that thermal energy is not just in the block, of course, uh, or not just in the table. That thermal energy is spread sort of partly in the block and partly in the table, but nevertheless, it's still part of the whole system. Okay. How much of that thermal energy goes in the block versus the table depends upon the thermal conductivity of the materials. Okay. You don't have to get into that detail. The point is that <coughs> you know the thermal energy. Um, Change in thermal energy is negative, change in the kinetic energy. Um, so in terms of transfer, when we think about conservation of energy in the form of, well, we've transferred energy to that block, and so um, the kinetic energy of that block has changed, we're thinking about the work kinetic energy theorem. So we say, yep, the total work done, the work done by all of the forces, the net work done, is equal to, in this case, the work done by all the forces was zero except for the force of kinetic friction. So the total work is just the work done by the force of kinetic friction. And the total work done in general, according to the work kinetic energy theorem, is the change in the kinetic energy. Okay, so what that says is this transfer um, relationship has a delta K in it. This storage relationship has a delta K in it. So we can eliminate delta K and solve. We can solve for delta E thermal. So that tells us that delta E thermal is equal to uh, negative delta K, which is negative FK. So it's negative the work done by friction. I could put FK here, but this is a general relationship. The change, whenever you have friction involved, the change in the thermal energy, so usually it's positive, <laughs> so there's an increase in the thermal energy, and it's negative the work done by the friction. And the work done by the friction is itself negative. So in the case where we have um, constant magnitude friction, then the work done by friction is negative F times delta S. So this is negative, negative F times delta S, which is then positive F delta S. So that's positive, okay? So this is really the key result at the end here. What it's saying is that, you know, you have friction acting when something is moving, and so the, you generate thermal energy, so um, energy goes from one form or another into thermal energy. So thermal energy goes up, other energies go down, so that total energy is conserved, okay? And so that change in the thermal energy is negative the work done by friction, but the work done by friction is negative, so negative of a negative is positive. So the change in the thermal energy is positive, and if the force of, of friction is constant in magnitude, it's just that positive, that constant um, in magnitude friction force times the length of the, of, of the path that the object moves along under that constant magnitude of friction force. Yeah, so that's the important thing. So whenever you're solving problems that, that involve friction, uh, you can you can say uh, you know write down delta E total is equal to zero. One of the forms of energy will be thermal. Okay, and so there'll be a change in thermal energy. Generally, that's equal to that's positive, and it's just equal to the magnitude of the force of friction times the path length. Okay, very good. So that's a little bit of discussion about thermal energy and how you deal with friction in terms of conservation of energy. Remember, whether there's friction or not. Energy is always conserved. Energy is a strictly conserved quantity. Okay, you don't lose energy <laughs> because there's friction. Right? Okay, very good.